chances are high now if this idiot, if this idiot decides to go into Iran before he gets out of office, you have seen nothing yet. And what you will see is the acceleration of the fall of the American empire. Do you know that there are generals in the Pentagon who don't want this war? Do you know that there are generals, white generals in the Pentagon who are angry over the influence that the Israelis have on American foreign policy? They don't want the war. Do you know that there are elements in the CIA who are angry at the influence of the Israelis in American foreign policy? Don't you remember that report that came out by the CIA, the NIE report, when they said that Iran stopped attempting to, they, they stopped attempting to make nuclear weapons three years ago? Don't you know what that was about? Don't you know that this idiot in the White House kept saying that Iran is trying to make nuclear weapons? Iran is trying to make nuclear weapons? Iran is trying to make nuclear weapons? And then the CIA comes out? The CIA comes out and says to Bush, you idiot, according to our intelligence, which is something that you don't have, if Iran stopped making nuclear weapons, stopped attempting to make nuclear weapons three years ago, that shows you that inside the administration there is conflict. And the neocons, the so-called neoconservative, Zionist Jews who are masquerading as right-wingers, right-wing conservatives, who the real conservatives don't like, they got angry at the CIA. Why would the CIA undermine President Bush like that? Because the CIA don't want no war in Iran. There, there are elements within the elite who are upset at Israel and upset at their influence, brothers and sisters. It's a new day. It's a different day. So all this has to be tied in to America and the so-called war on terrorism. Another 60s is coming. You must prepare. And for my Muslim brothers and sisters, we're saying keep on doing what you're doing. Don't let them scare you. Don't let them intimidate you. You see, ladies and gentlemen, you have Israelis here who would actually come out and say, I was a part of the IDF. They can say that and, and the police and the FBI won't do nothing to them. They can actually say, I'm a part of the IDF. Imagine someone get up and say, yes, I was a part of the Third Reich. Right? That type of thing, right? But they can go ahead and say that. They can go ahead and say that and no one's going to say anything to them. Nobody's going to come up to them and say, wait a minute, did you say you were part of the IDF? Okay, we need to get your name. No, they can just say it. But let one of the brothers talk about, yes, and I'm from Hezbollah and Hamas. Boy, they will have the FBI at their doorstep before they get the word out their mouth. So these Muslim youth, in spite of those odds, are standing up in a witch hunt, in a witch hunt. Not, they're not treated. They're not treated like any other groups on campus because the Israelis try to put so much pressure on the administration to come down on them. But they still go. And you see San Diego, they tried to tell the Muslim students, you can't have this speaker come on campus unless you have your own security that you pay for. No other groups, no other student groups have to pay for security. But they tried to make the Muslims pay for their security and then they stopped because they knew they weren't being fair. That's the type of stuff that these Muslim students have to go through. But they still prevail. They still speak up and they still speak out and they will not allow themselves to be intimidated because they're thinking if that 12 year old boy with a rock can go up against a tank then the least we can do is in America is to speak up and speak out irrespective what they say about us irrespective of what they try to do to us and so again I say to the Muslim Student Association keep going don't stop keep inspiring other people You'd be surprised how many people have been inspired by your example. You've seen it. As I said, you've seen it this week. That's what's happening on other campuses as well. The Muslims are hook hooking up with people of conscience. The Muslims are hooking up with other people of color, other oppressed people, as I said, and other people of conscience. And it's happening all over the place. So keep it up. And the more you do it, the more it destroys the morale of the enemies of truth and justice. It destroys their morale. They start doing silly stuff to try to keep you from being heard. They start doing silly stuff to try to shut you up. No, if you have the truth, then bring it. A law is clear. When truth comes, it smashes the brains out of falsehood. Falsehood is not more powerful than the truth. Truth is always more powerful. That is why these Muslim students can stand on this truth irrespective of the consequences and irrespective of what's being said about them. 
I will close with this. We, have, we say it a lot because we have to. It's amazing because back in 1968, some of us were children. And we saw a lot. We saw a lot. We saw so much in 1968 at such a young age that by the time we were in our early 20s, the first thing we wanted to do was get politically active. We wanted to get active. And in getting politically active, brothers and sisters, it taught us a lot about struggle. It taught us a lot about movement. One of the things that we wanted to find out in the early 80s, because for the children of the 60s, those who were children in the 60s, in the late 60s particularly, by the time 81 and 82 came, we were in our early 20s. Having seen the Panthers, having seen Muhammad Ali, having seen Dr. King, some of us even Malcolm, by the time we were early 80s came, we were in our early 20s and we were politicized. And so when hip hop hit the scene, hip hop hit the scene in early 80s, that's why it was political. It was children of the 60s who had brought in hip hop. That's why it was political. But in the early 20s, we did a study. One of the things we wanted to know was when we grew up in this period, when we saw unity, we saw togetherness, we saw militancy, we saw people who were out, who were, who were, who were committed and dedicated. By the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, it was all destroyed. It was all destroyed. And one of the things that we did when we were your age is we wanted to know what happened. How come it's changed? How come the community went from a place to where everybody knew each other, you didn't have to lock your doors, it was all tight, it was all, you know, just really tight, it was family, to the point to where bars were on windows, you had to lock your doors, everybody treated each other like strangers. How did that, why did that change? And we studied it. And what we saw in our early 20s had an effect on us that is still with us to this day. Not only did we notice that leaders were assassinated, not only did we notice that organizations were destroyed, but we noticed how they were destroyed. We saw the role that drugs played in destroying the movement. And for many of us, even before we became Muslim, when we found out the role that drugs played in destroying the 60s, many of us stopped taking drugs because we understood they used this drug thing on us to destroy our movement. Young people understand that the way that the movement was destroyed in the 60s was that there was a thorough corruption of everything. Those leaders who couldn't be bought were killed. Those leaders who couldn't be bought were bought. That's why some of those same leaders are millionaires today. Those leaders who couldn't be frightened were put in jail and are still in jail to this day. Some of those leaders had to go into exile, but all of a sudden, we noticed more drugs in our communities. All of a sudden, instead of young brothers joining the Panthers, they joined gangs. And now these gangs were fighting each other. They weren't fighting the system anymore. They were fighting each other. Because you're wearing red and I'm wearing blue. And then once they threw gangs in there, then they were guns. I mean some sophisticated guns were ending up in the black community. And once you have drugs, gangs, and guns, the movement is destroyed. Because the soldiers who were protecting the community now turned on the community. And that had an effect on us. And so as we go through this next 60s, as we go through this next period, young people, learn from that history. Learn from that history that they're going to try to keep you corrupted because the people who you are fighting against know that you can't, that you can't fight them if you have been corrupted. You can't fight them. They know it. You'll be, you'll be ready to do no type of sacrifice, no show, no type of commitment because you've been corrupted so much. That's what they did. And don't think they won't do it again. Because also in the early 80s, when the children of the 60s started getting busy, guess what else jumped off? Crack cocaine. Go back and look at it. Crack cocaine started in the early 80s. When there was like a mini 60s going on in the early 80s, it was all about crack. That is not a coincidence. And now, when they see this activism, when they see this activism jumping off, and see young people starting to wake up, starting to think about things, starting to get more active, you can best believe that they will use some of the same tactics to keep you corrupted. Because the more corrupted you become, the less effective you will be in standing up for truth and justice. Truth and justice. Brothers and sisters, we thank you for listening. 
We thank you for inviting us 